Pardon me, I'm not used to public speaking, and this is very long and pedantic, so go with me. Praise be to our Lord, who set the stairs to swinging and adjusted the stage lights, and run up the curtain and cued the opening number. And praise be to his sweet, sacred mouthpiece, Muhammad. May he blow forever in the great cathedral head of beauty. And praise be for the storyteller's gig, whereby all the cats and kitties and chicks and studs of the world might hit themselves to wild, crazy scenes beyond the range of their five gates to the soul. And amongst these is the lit of the 1,000 swinging nights and another night on the side, boom, boom, which contained riffs of triple, insane, wig-stretching gassers like you ain't never before dug in your natural-born life. <clears throat> and, uh, like that. Now, back in what Brother Kipling's old nanny called the high and far-off times, there was a dynasty of king heads whose rule uncovered whole stretches of Asia. And these non-stop studs been on top of the heap so long, they was all cocksure of themselves, you know, strutting around, coming on all snide and sassy to everybody, even each other. In fact, they was so sassy and so snide that that become the tag by which they is written into the scrolls of history, the Sassanides. See what I say? And the two sassiest and snidest of this whole lineage was a pair of brothers who was such loose souls that their old man had to split his soil stash north and south wise and give them each half just to keep them apart because he knew that if he gained just one of them as kingdom they'd be dragging on each other too much to ever take care of business and what kind of bad jazz do these two studs wail up when they get together that is what we is here today tonight the older brother was a big strapping stud and an equestrian head. He loved to play the ponies. And he was always getting his noble heads together to go out hunting and get his horsemen and his houndsmen and his falconeers stomp out into the mother prime evil, come back with a couple elephants and tigers on his fender saying, yeah, I killed these beasts with my own hands. Ain't I a stud? Ain't I a gas? Ain't I the baddest cat on the sphere? And all his buddy cats jump up and say, Yep, you sure are. You great. Sure you are. Sure you are. And they was always sounding them like that so much that in time that come to be the cat's tag. Sure you are. You dig? Now the younger brother was made the Shah of Samarkand, which was a very jumping town in them days. And when he picked up on how everybody was talking up his brother, he knew he got to make a name for himself. But he weren't no hunting and riding type stud, so what he done is, he put down an off-ramp from the Silk Road, which run right by San Marcan there, and skim a little trim off the Silk Trade, see what I mean, and then whipped up a great swinging main day breeze for all his populants, with some fine Shiraz juice flowing, and great silver trays of citrons and cordillis and acrobats everywhere and chicks jumping around and jingling little pasties and the hot jazz blowing and the next day every cat in town is saying weren't that some kind of wild crazy scene you took the Shaw's last night? Uh, you're telling me Charlie a joint was jumping. The Shaw is a man what knows how to swing. Uh, yes sir, yes sir. That Shaw is the man all right. The Shaw is the man. And that's how the cat's tag come to be recorded in the Chronicles as Shah Zaman. And these two studs grooved in their own scene for about 20 years, until finally Shariar say, Been a long time now since I laid eyeballs on my little brother cat. Go put the sound out Samar Kand way, and he'll know to join me out down here, and we can blow up a little hot jazz together and make the scene. So his vizier loaded up all the camels and split for Samarkand. Finally, he come back with the brother cat in tow, but let me hit thee. Shah Zaman looked drug. His map was all long and woeful, like the burdens of the world was all piled up under his wig, driving him right into the ground. His turban all skewed to one side, 
looking like he ain't oiled his mustache in a week. So Shari R say, what's dragging you, my brother? You look like someone swiped your stash and kicked your dog. What's going down here? But Shah Zaman, he say, I don't want to talk about it. And Shari R say, how about some scarf? You've been on the road and hungry and all. No? Well, I've done laid out a big hunting expedition for us for tomorrow. You should make that scene. Sun and fresh air do you some good, Jack. But Shah Zaman say, you just go on without me. I'll be all right here. I got me some heavy singing to do. So Shari R say, as you will, whatever, later. <laughs> and he take off and have himself time, cutting out through the fields and the mountains and the jungles. And when he come back, he seen his brother with a smile on his puss and chomping on goodies from the royal cupboard. So Shari R say, that's more like it. Glad to see you recharged, so hit me. What was it that was dragging you so? And what cooled you out while I was gone? Shah Zaman say, I'll tell you what drugged me, but you gotta swear not to ask what got me undrugged. Well, if you say so, well I say so. And the cat say, so? And so, Shah Zaman explained how gassed he was to get the invite from his brother's vizier and how he got all his affairs of state all straight and up to date and loaded up all his own humpers with the gifts and scarf for the voyage and blew. But he won't know more than half a day from Samarkand when he hipped himself that he had left behind a present for his brother. So he tell all his buddy cats and companion train he got to swing back home for something and he'd catch up with him later. So, he come back into the city without no parade or fanfare and go up into his pad. And just as he's passing by the boudoir, he hear his reason for living, the queen. And she's saying, Oh, where me, my special lover, the sweetest and grooviest highball and stud to ever stomp this side of the Himalayas. Fall in, lover. And Shah Zaman think, Oh, my little kitty is missing me already. But before he can get another bubble in his wig, a big old cook from the palace kitchen with his hands all greasy and sweat from the ovens on his brow pop up and say, here I is. And he wrap his big greasy mitts around the queen's royal proper and he starts smooching her on her wing and on her shoulder and on her neck. And together they plunge into the silk. When Shah Zaman dug this scene, brothers, he blew his stack. See, any fool know he can't blow that sort of jazz around no sassanide stud. So, he whip out his lean, wicked, skinny talk, tiptoe into the room, and it say right here in the historical chronicles, chapter 2, verse 17, subparagraph C, it say, and I quote, he cut the two into four. Dig that. Shari R hear all this, and he say, well, <laughs> that is a serious bring down there. Good thing there ain't no monkey business like that going down in my pad. Shah Zaman say, don't be too sure, brother. 